Hello, my name is Tracy Kulik. Um, my co-presenter unfortunately had a family emergency, so I am it. I'm going to just introduce myself. Um, I'm the Vice President of Health Access at Germain Solutions, and I met you all through working with Jack Salo and Emma and Lenore with the Rural Health Network on data measures for social determinants of health. And through that, met Mark and Lisa Bobby and Lisa Berard, and have been working with the Eastern Regional Performing Unit on developing value propositions. So in that light, I'm going to go through what we've discovered um, in light of evidence-based practices and storytelling. And I think you're going to see a lot of themes that you saw in the keynote presentation. First of all, our themes from today's session. The value propositions or even the assessments that we did of what we call the three super CBOs, uh, Rural Health Network, Mothers and Babies Perinatal Network, and Tioga Opportunities, and the cohorts, all are con concise stories that have been created by the agencies, featuring the agencies as the lead character in the story, and then journaled by us as an objective entity. So if we will, if you will, we're one of those stories where there's a third party telling the story that they observed and are somewhat a part of, but are more journaling and narrating. Um, these stories all convey very much so the heart or the passion or mission of these individual community-based organizations. They tell what their goals and their focus are, but they are moving towards having more of an integrated head story. At this point, they are much more passionate mission statements, but with the desire to move to marry that with a quantification and an ask or a request or a move to action. They have science or data that supports their story, and in some instances, like the value propositions, that isn't as formative as we would like it to be, which is the reason we're starting with the narrative. But that's something we're moving towards creating. In other instances, like the assessment of the three super CBOs, they either have <coughs> impact data or they have it for key programs, but not overall, and are moving towards that. In the cohorts, they're very precise interventions of collaboratives that have a stratified impact, and they show what that is by, a, in, by year in a five-year trend, and also by phases of intervention. So these are along a spectrum of a value proposition. They're highly iterative. We work with the people, the characters in the story, who are the agencies or the program and service leads in the agencies or the cohort collaborative of agencies to tell their story and to keep asking for data and feedback and have the characters customize their story by their own point of view. And then there's always a call to action or request or an ask. I will tell you one thing that's interesting with this and we discussed this in the last session the asks are probably too modest right now, believe it or not. People haven't got used to Christmas here and saying, I want to be more ambitious with my ask. But this is an evolutionary process in which people are trying to learn how to assume risk. And so the ask in a pilot is usually a more modest ask. And then there's an awareness that the initial value proposition, whether these are uh, that uh, basic presentation or a two-page value proposition as in the Eastern Regional Performing Unit are going to lead to further information requests. I know I've worked with Sharon and Mothers and Babies and we're going from the two-page to a, a broader value proposition that really details the individual programs. Now, what projects are underway that this applies to? We talked about the super CBO agency assessments in which we've gone through a more detailed uh, assessment using logic models. These are multi-page and, if you will, maybe even more academic assessments. 
We've talked about the cohorts in which groups of providers are focused on individual clinical interventions and their role in those, whether those are social determinants of health or actual clinical interventions and how they're going to achieve that and what the social return on investment is for that. And then we have the value propositions, which are at the pretty much the primordial stage. How are they starting to tell their story as an individual agency? What might be the pilot through that? And what very much so is the need for quantification or data? So if you will, the first one is a combined heart head ask. The second is very much a head ask. And the third is a almost totally hard ask, moving to what is the head information that's required. And is that even available? Some of the background that's a little more academic about stories that informs this. Um, story structure and means to craft a structure. A uh, plot of an effective story is told around, and we already heard this, challenge, choice, and outcome. And the character's moving towards some kind of goal. And in your instance, this is a value-based contract. Now, what that value-based contract is can be different for different agencies and for different programs or services. We talked in the prior presentation about moving towards a dual eligible or Medicaid and Medicare ask for an initial pilot because it doesn't require big scale. And this is in the Eastern Regional Performing Unit, which in managed care, typically the baseline is 100,000 covered lives. And Delaware and Shenango County together, cats, dogs, people, is 100,000 lives. Population, not even covered lives. So something like dual eligibles that's high cost, high risk, but smaller, makes sense for a pilot here and could be an entree with a payer. And the choice is to pilot something and to say, let's work with the payer as our audience, our buyer, our investor, and let's see what that outcome should be. The public narrative is often useful here in outside track instances. And what this means in English, very academic term, is another discussion we have from the prior uh, session, which is, at many times you have to start with an evidence-based or a literature review-based assumption of what your return is going to be. And then start to proactively say, what is my return on investment? Or what is something that I could do as far as a percentage intervention? For instance, if I wanted to avoid ED visits, I start with evidence, some kind of literature that says 20% could be avoided. Now, in certain instances, like public housing for development, developmentally disabled, that could very well be 40%. But you're starting with a conservative figure and then working towards assessing what is that really. By looking as you go, what do we avoid using some kind of metric tool. So it's a way to get your quantitative data or the head part of your story. The story of yourself, and this pretty much self, us, and now, follows what we heard in the promising uh, storytelling uh, opening, and talks about this fairly much in the context of any of these three, whether it was the ERPU value propositions, the super CBOs, or the cohort, going from the basic to the most sophisticated. We're talking about who the requester is, what their mission is, what their statement and their passion and commitment is. So again, their heart story. We are then moving to who is their audience and how do we want to interact with that audience. And this is something we found throughout all the levels, but very much so at the base level with the ERPU. We don't know how to talk to payers, or we may not know payers. Our payer is the state of New York. Um, how do we get to know how a payer thinks and what do we have in common? One of the a little controversial suppositions I'll give you from having worked both with payers and with healthcare systems and CBOs are community-based organizations. There's a reason community leads in that word. 
They know their community. They know that overall demographic, and they know them literally where they live. That is very similar to a payer who thinks in terms of population. In between our healthcare systems who think of who do we get? Historically, think of what is our market share or who do we see? It isn't as community, traditionally, isn't as community oriented as a CBO or a payer. So there's a lot in common between these two. And there, yet the payer now has a means to get into a specific community. What you're trying to do is interest in as to why that's worthwhile to them financially. So we're ending with the call to action. How do you specifically, as an agency, interest a payer as to why you're a good investment? Some of the very academic, and I'm going to go fast through this because it will probably cause you to blur, but what they call as gray literature. Uh, those of you who are used to white literature is what you as an agency or you as a community say. Black literature is peer review, published, academic. It's out there, and it's been vetted. In between is gray literature, and this is a term that many people are adopting. It's articles, but they're not, they're not in the commercial literature. They are things that are in government, academics, or business, but they haven't gone through all these, no offense to any of the academics here, tortuous levels of what it takes to be peer reviewed. And this is where we start to transition from what we do in community practice to peer reviewed and evidence-based interventions. And I'm just going to stay light on this because it can get murky fast, but it is very important for reimbursement, particularly when we use examples like Lenore and I were just discussing, and earlier this week, Jack and Emma and Pam Guth and I, community health workers, and getting those to be reimbursed. There you have to be peer reviewed to get accredited, and it is a check the square kind of process. So gray literature is an in-between with it, and it really is where a lot of these stories come in. They start to populate a business article, if you've read these about, uh, you know, a certain community has a very high incidence of suicide or suicidal ideation. That would be a gray literature piece. And as it migrated into a business article or even a government article, like on a New York State Department of Health website, that is gray literature moving towards peer review. As it moves to peer review, it's in academic publications. And as it moves to peer review, you get into evidence-based strategies. Four categories of evidence-based strategies. Those people in mental health know this cold. They don't always like it because it can be restrictive. But the highest level is an evidence-based practice. This is the minor. There's not that many that actually exist, even in mental health. Substance abuse is another area that plays heavily in this, not only for credibility, but for reimbursement. This is peer review literature that's had randomized controlled studies. Think CDC, NIH. This is where we had an intervention group and we had a group that didn't get the full intervention and you had a double blind, a randomly controlled study. A lot of ethical issues with this, but that proves that this is an effective intervention. And then it's published in academic journals. Those of us like me who didn't get a PhD resent this because I do a lot of the writing and then a PhD takes it and runs with it. But that's where it gets vetted and gets reimbursed. Evidence-based programs have been in the peer review literature. They're in the academic journals, but they don't have a randomized controlled study either completed or um, actually published. It may be underway. Evidence-informed practices. This is the one you're going to see a whole lot of. They're in the field. Practitioners use them a lot. They're not in the literature or in the peer-reviewed literature yet. Promising practices is where a lot of interest lies because this is 
a evidence-informed practice in formation. Think groups that you just have trouble getting at. Native Americans is a big one of these. Um, LBGTQI population is a big one of these. There are practices that are used that are very accepted, but they haven't gone through all this scientific journaling. Why go through all this other than you're a PhD and it's your lifeblood and it's published or perish? This is because this is where national federal funding, grant funding, and reimbursement comes. Now, shockingly enough to me, I'm always amazed at this, Medicare will fund three and four. Medicaid in most states will only fund one and two. So the states are harder to get that funding through than the feds. But there's some tripwires that if you have federal funding, you could qualify for state and bypass a lot of this, especially if it's in formation. All helpful to know to just deal through how does a story move to science. And one can argue with a lot of this. I certainly can debate it. Making the transition over to social determinants of health and the national scene, and then I'll close for Mark and Lenore's excellent presentation. We've talked about social determinants of health. We've talked about the importance of these factors being more important in your health than what many of us have traditionally come from, which is the historical healthcare system. With all due respect to it, even operating at its highest level, it is responsible for about 20% of your health. So what are some national evidence-based efforts by states? Again, states are harder, and unfortunately or fortunately, you live in a state that is really hard on getting things to a reimbursed level, largely because New York, California, Texas are the big volume states. And so there's an economic impact if they go to reimbursed. Some of these states work on social determinants of health. Colorado and New York require Medicaid managed care organizations to have a relationship with the CBO. Scope of services. Rhode Island is requiring screening for social determinants. Oregon requires Medicaid managed cares to actually intervene with social determinants. Massachusetts is asking all their Medicaid managed care organizations to measure social determinants of health and screen for it, and is also moving to risk adjust and cost target based on these, and is doing neighborhood stress scores or acuity ratings. So you see a lot of movement by states, not surprisingly, with the exception of Rhode Island, who is financially stressed. These are bigger states with bigger impacts of Medicaid on their budgets. Medicaid is either the number one or the number two cost driver of a state's budget. Education is the one that flips back and forth with it. On the national level, a lot of movement by the big payers here. Um, Kaiser Permanente, I think a lot of you have heard of their Thrive program. And they are in multiple states, have a lot of covered lives. And they have flipped a lot of this social determinant thought process on its head. Instead of saying, I'm looking at cardiac or respiratory or perinatal, they're like, I'm looking at housing and saying, it affects diabetes, it affects cardiac, it affects oncology. So they're funding for housing. And they're saying, we're going to fund for housing in different settings and see how that compares. How does it compare in like a homeless shelter? How does it compare in scattered site? How does it compare in group home? Um, Humana, they're also looking at food insecurity and transportation. Not surprisingly, they're in some of the western states where transportation and housing may be a bigger issue than food. Humana is working in seven communities almost entirely with high Medicaid, and they're working to have a stated goal of impacting 20%. Now, I know Sharon asked this question in a previous setting, why 20%? That's where most people start. It's not a scientific figure, but it's one that's conservative that people think they can impact. It's probably higher than that, depending on the social determinant that you're using. 
And then CareSource. CareSource is the third largest Medicaid managed care organization in the country. It's uh, larger than Molina. They came up with a life services program and they intentionally are using this in the five states that they're located. I know them because they came from a place, I used to be on their board, um, that started about, oh gosh, 30 years ago. I'm dating myself, but um, they intentionally are trying to move Medicaid members off the Medicaid rolls. Very attractive to a state because as ACA came on, some of the states saw these huge increases in Medicaid eligibles and they couldn't afford the program. And they're working to have a comprehensive employment, educational, housing, uh, nutritional, transportation program so that these people get jobs that are employee sponsored, employer sponsored insurance and are no longer on Medicaid. Now, you might argue is that noble or just practical, but it is. And we're done. Any questions?